Before we get into today's show, I have an urgent update to share with you. As you probably know, this podcast is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. And with our financial year ending on June 30th, we're facing a $52,000 gap in funding that must be closed by this date. With just days to go, generous friends of the ministry have now offered to match every dollar given towards this goal up to $10,000. So please take a moment today to give your best gift at premierinsight.org slash Bible in a Year. That's premierinsight.org forward slash Bible in a Year. Thank you for understanding how important your gift is today and for giving generously. And now it's time for today's podcast. The Bible in a Year, bringing the Word to life. Father God, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you teach us, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. May that be true for us today as we listen to your word. Amen. Psalm 78, verses 32 to 39. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility and their years in terror. Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God Most High was their Redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet, He was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. Acts chapter 18 verses 9 to chapter 19 verse 21. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanour or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, Settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on the Sothenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancreo because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there 
and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Figuria, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill, and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit, jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house, naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. 1 Kings chapter 20 and chapter 21 Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mustered his entire army. Accompanied by thirty-two kings with their horses and chariots, he went up and besieged Samaria and attacked it. He sent messengers into the city to Ahab king of Israel, saying, This is what Ben-Hadad says, Your silver and gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. 
The king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. The messengers came again and said, This is what Ben-Hadad says, I sent to demand your silver and gold, your wives and your children. But about this time tomorrow I am going to send my officials to search your palace and the houses of your officials. They will seize everything you value and carry it away. The king of Israel summoned all the elders of the land and said to them, See how this man is looking for trouble. When he sent for my wives and my children, my silver and my gold, I did not refuse him. The elders and the people all answered, Don't listen to him or agree to his demands. So he replied to Ben-Hadad's messengers, Tell my lord the king, Your servant will do all you demanded the first time, but this demand I cannot meet. They left and took the answer back to Ben-Hadad. Then Ben-Hadad sent another message to Ahab, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if enough dust remains in Samaria to give each of my men a handful. The king of Israel answered, Tell him, One who puts on his armor should not boast like one who takes it off. Ben-Hadad heard this message while he and the kings were drinking in their tents, and he ordered his men, Prepare to attack. So they prepared to attack the city. Meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and announced, This is what the Lord says, Do you see this vast army? I will give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. But who will do this? asked Ahab. The prophet replied, This is what the Lord says, The junior officers under the provincial commanders will do it. And who will start the battle? he asked. The prophet answered, You will. So Ahab summoned the 232 junior officers under the provincial commanders. Then he assembled the rest of the Israelites, 7,000 in all. They set out at noon, while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings allied with him were in their tents getting drunk. The junior officers under the provincial commanders went out first. Now Ben-Hadad had dispatched scouts who reported, Men are advancing from Samaria. He said, If they have come out for peace, take them alive. If they have come out for war, take them alive. The junior officers under the provincial commanders marched out of the city with the army behind them, and each one struck down his opponent. At that the Arameans fled, with the Israelites in pursuit. But Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on horseback with some of his horsemen. The king of Israel advanced and overpowered the horses and chariots and inflicted heavy losses on the Arameans. Afterwards the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Strengthen your position and see what must be done, because next spring the king of Aram will attack you again. Meanwhile, the officials of the king of Aram advised him, Their gods are gods of the hills, that is why they were too strong for us. But if we fight them on the plains, surely we will be stronger than they. Do this. Remove all the kings from their commands and replace them with other officers. You must also raise an army like the one you lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, so we can fight Israel on the plains. Then surely we will be stronger than they. He agreed with them and acted accordingly. The next spring Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans, and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. When the Israelites were also mustered and given provisions, they marched out to meet them. The Israelites camped opposite them like two small flocks of goats, while the Arameans covered the countryside. The man of God came up and told the king of Israel, This is what the Lord says. Because the Arameans think the Lord is a god of the hills and not a god of the valleys, I will deliver this vast army into your hands, and you will know that I am the Lord. For seven days they camped opposite each other, and on the seventh day the battle was joined. The Israelites inflicted a hundred thousand casualties on the Aramean foot soldiers in one day. The rest of them escaped to the city of Aphek where the war collapsed on 27,000 of them, and Ben-Hadad fled to the city and hid in an inner room. 
His officials said to him, Look, we have heard that the kings of Israel are merciful. Let us go to the king of Israel with sackcloth round our waists and ropes round our heads. Perhaps he will spare your life. Wearing sackcloth round their waists and ropes round their heads, they went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. The king answered, Is he still alive? He is my brother. The men took this as a good sign, and were quick to pick up his word. Yes, your brother Ben-Hadad, they said. Go and get him, the king said. When Ben-Hadad came out, Ahab brought him up to his chariot. I will return the cities my father took from your father, Ben-Hadad offered. You may set up your own market areas in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. Ahab said, On the basis of a treaty, I will set you free. So he made a treaty with him and let him go. By the word of the Lord, one of the company of the prophets said to his companion, Strike me with your weapon. But he refused. So the prophet said, Because you have not obeyed the Lord, as soon as you leave me a lion will kill you. And after the man went away, a lion found him and killed him. The prophet found another man and said, Strike me, please. So the man struck him and wounded him. Then the prophet went and stood by the road waiting for the king. He disguised himself with his headband down over his eyes. As the king passed by, the prophet called out to him, Your servant went into the thick of the battle, and someone came to me with a captive and said, Guard this man. If he is missing, it will be your life for his life, or you must pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy here and there, the man disappeared. That is your sentence, the king of Israel said. You have pronounced it yourself. Then the prophet quickly removed the headband from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. He said to the king, This is what the Lord says. You have set free a man I had determined should die. Therefore it is your life for his life, your people for his people. Sullen and angry, the king of Israel went to his palace in Samaria. 1 Kings chapter 21 Sometime later there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange I will give you a better vineyard, or, if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel his wife said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting, and gave Naboth a prominent seat among the people but put two scoundrels opposite him and get them to bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city did as Jezebel directed in the letters she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Nahab before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, 
Get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite that he refused to sell to you. He is no longer alive, but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I am going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, Dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Father God, you reminded us today to trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Thank you for today's words of wisdom. Amen. For more resources to help you bring the word to life, go to premier.org.uk forward slash Bible. This reading has been taken from the NIV Bible Biblica and is published by Hodder and Stoughton. In a time when censorship is ever growing, it's never been more important for Christians to join together and protect our right to keep the doors open for the gospel. At ADF International, we envision a future where everyone is free to live and speak the truth. The inherent dignity of every person is championed, and the good news of the Christian message resounds across the globe. At any given point in time, we have over a thousand cases and legal matters open all around the world, actualizing a strategic legal response to the great challenges facing people of faith today. Everyone says they want to change the world, and by joining our Amicus team, you will. Your financial support will become a lifeline to those punished and persecuted for their beliefs. Join us and discover how you can be the catalyst for change at adf.uk slash premier.